Hi, Alex, how are you?
Hi, Kim Yu. How are you? I am good. How are you? I am fine too. Thank good you so morning. much for joining us this afternoon. Oh, you're welcome. Ah, uh, great. Good to see you. I can see your video. It's clear. Do you have your presentation so that you can share and see if um, it's okay or if there's any issue? I've made you co-host, so you should be able to share your screen as well. Great. Um, I believe that Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi is going to share her screen. Oh, she's going to share and, hers. Okay. Yeah, she's going to do it from her side. All right. No worries. But I saw your presentation. It looks great. <laughs> I'm very excited and looking forward to um, uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're very excited to be part of this. Thank you. Um, um, just so, in terms um, of, just in terms of a little uh, logistics, mm -hmm. um, so that I understand, the first hour will be the presentation. Yes, with all three of us, right? Mm -hmm. And then after yes. we will have breakouts, and each yes. of us will get a breakout room. Correct. Yes. And that is for about 45 minutes. Is that yes. right? Yes. And then how much time do we have after? Afterwards, we have also about 45 minutes for the groups okay. to present or however long they'll take um, to present what they have discussed in the groups. And then um, we round up the workshop. Wonderful. That sounds yes. perfect. Yeah. So let me just admit Dr. Viviana. Ring, ring. It's my phone, but I'm silent. Yeah, there she is. Good morning, Hello, Vivi. Viviana. How are you? By the way, it's 3 a.m. for you. Thank you so much for the commitment. <laughs> I'd forgotten how early that um that time will be in Eastern time, but we really appreciate you being here. Hi, Rawia. How are you? Let me make her co-host so that she can unmute as well. Um, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am good. Welcome. Thank you for uh, in, including me oh, in hello. today. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> it's here finally. We've been planning this for so long. That's right. <laughs> yes. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much Viviana and Kim for joining us so early. There's someone who had joined and I wonder if it's, let me just admit. I wonder whether it's Humphrey. I'm not so sure. Yeah, um, just have them unmute and see who it is. Okay, so in terms of the rundown for the workshop, I'm going to begin by introducing Afro PHC. Then I will introduce the workshop, just the layout and um, what we're going to discuss today. Then I will hand it over to you, Rawir. Then you're going to introduce um, Viviana and um, uh, Kim. I hope you have their bios in front of you on the concept note. Yes, yes, I have them. I have okay, them. great. And then after that, um, you're going to introduce them. They're going to do their presentation. Then afterwards, you'll introduce, um, um, sorry, let me see if it's him. Hello, who is um, Yo MFOFO? Hello. Hello? Yeah, hello. Yes. Hi, how are you? I'm very good. How are yes. you? Yes. I'm fine, thank you. Sorry, could you do you mind introducing yourself? Okay, my name is Yaum Fafu from Ghana. I, oh, thank you so I much mean, for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, we are just setting up the meeting before we let people in and we start. So thank okay. you for joining on time. All right, thank you. All right. So um, I think Maurice is yet to join us. Probably like, I'll just um, send him a text and see if he'll be joining us. So after that, Rawia, we'll, we can have a short question and answer uh, session. 
Um, if people have any questions for uh, about the presentation or they need any clarification, just about maybe five or 10 minutes. And then from there, uh, we will go to the breakout sessions. So I will put you each in, um, in a different group um, so that you can help with the facilitation. But in the groups, you can choose a repertoire, someone to like write the notes and then present later. And then from there, um, we come back to, uh, I'll set the groups for about 45 minutes. And then once the time runs out, we come back and the groups present what they have. Then we have a short discussion and wrap up and maybe some um, final comments from all our panelists. And then um, I will close the workshop or I'll have a, a board member from Afro PHC um, close the workshop and we'll be done. Um, any questions? Um, Viviana, would you mind sharing your screen so that we can make sure we don't have any um, technical hitches? Oh, and we have Alex with us. Alex is our French English, English French uh, interpreter, because we normally have people joining from Francophone Africa. Um, hi, Alex. Oh, there we go. Are you able to put it in um, slideshow mode? Or full screen? Oh, there we go. Yeah, seems fine. All right. Okay, any questions or um, concerns? Yes, Alex, I will do that. Thank you. All right, so I think we can... Um, um, just wait for more people. Let me just um, en uh, uh, enable the people in the waiting room to start joining. Then we'll start at the top of the hour, depending on how many people have joined, or maybe five minutes past the hour. Okay. Okay.
My name is uh, Dr. Masi Wanjala. Uh, from, I'm a family physician from Kenya and the Deputy Executive Coordinator for Afro PHC. And I would like to welcome you today to our 10th and last workshop for um, 2022. And today we are going to be looking at bridging the gap, the issue of health equity in primary healthcare in Africa. And for those of you who are not familiar with Africa Forum for Primary Healthcare, it is a non-governmental um, organization registered in Johannesburg. And the main, um, the main uh, mission of Afro PHC is to bring together all the leaders and also frontline healthcare workers who work in the primary healthcare space in Africa to advocate for strengthening of primary healthcare systems in Africa for the achievement of universal health coverage. And amongst um, uh, other things, other than the policy workshop, which we are doing today, we have CPD programs that run every Thursday. Um, and um, you can register on the WCA platform uh, on our website, that is afrophc.org. You become a member and also register on the platform and um, you'll be able to receive information about our CPD. We also have an agreement with AMREF on the leadership, uh, the, the leadership uh, management and governance in health system strengthening course, where we have been running um, uh, monthly meetings for all who have registered. We are actually almost through. We are remaining with, with two modules to finish the course and have people graduate in January. So you can also go to afrophc.org and see how you can be part of our next cohort next year. We also have the Afro PHC Research and Mentorship Program, which is ongoing, uh, although for that enrollment closed in um, July with now 18 uh, researchers um, having concept notes and working with mentors to develop that concept note. We also have research partnerships we are working on with other organizations to develop a practice-based research network for Africa. That is something you can also get involved in. You just need to register your interest on our website. So go to afropxc.org, see how you can become a member and how you can get involved in our activities. And with that, I'd like to bring us to our policy workshop today, which is on Bridging the Gap Health Equity in Primary Healthcare in Africa, where we aim to explore the factors that contribute to disparities and inequity in the provision of primary healthcare in Africa and recommend practical and applicable solutions to bridge the gap. Our objectives today are just two, to determine the contributing factors to health disparities and inequities in the African setting, and to explore practical solutions to bridge the gap and promote health equity. With us, we have three members of the panel, which will uh, who will be introduced to you um, later on by our moderator, but the panel is going to answer the question, how best can we address the factors that contribute to health disparities and inequities in the primary healthcare setting. And um, we are going to have about 60 minutes where we'll have our panel members uh, make a presentation. Afterwards, we'll have a short Q&A um, session for about five to 10 minutes, just to clarify anything that was not clear in the presentations. After that, we will break out into uh, groups where we are going to discuss three group, uh, two group questions, which I'm going to post in the chat. After the group discussions, we are going to have uh, uh, plenary where we'll have uh, repertoires whom you've selected from your groups uh, coming back to give what they have discussed in their groups and then from there we'll have a final short discussion with a final word from all our panelists and with that I would like to introduce our moderator for today who is Rawia Kamal uh, Kamaldin Mohammed who has a BSc Honours in Medical Laboratory Sciences from the University of Khartoum. She also has an MBA in International Management and Hospital Management, Project Management. She's a Project Management Professional and a Project Risk Man Management Professional. She's also a member of the American Society of Clinical Pathology and a Founder and General Manager of Healthcare for Management Consulting. She's currently co collaborating with the Federal Ministry of Health. Directorate uh, General of Health Policies and Planning. She's also collaborating with the WHO Sudan office in, cap in the capacity of um, uh, building in the capacity building programs. She is a member of the Africa Forum for Primary Healthcare Executive Coordinating uh, uh, Team. And she's a volunteer at the Sadagat Charity Organization and a member of Young Arabs Research Network for Social and Economic Rights. And with that, I hand it over to you, Rawia. Welcome.
Rawia, you are muted. Just hello, Rabia. Yes, hello. Uh, hello, go good ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning to uh, uh, Kim and Viviana. Thank you for joining us for uh, despite of this uh, disparities in uh, local time. Uh, thank you. I'm Rawi, and thank you, Mercy, for this uh, great introduction. Uh, kindly allow me to introduce to the, uh, hello everyone, and kindly allow me to introduce our speakers for today. Our uh, uh, spe uh, panel speakers for today are Dr. Marish Humphrey Ajuk, the country manager of uh, Amrith Health Africa in South Sudan. Uh, Dr. Ham uh, Dr. Ajuk served as the country manager of Amrith Health in uh, uh, Health Africa in South Sudan. He is an experienced leader in the field of global public health in health emergencies, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, okay sexual and reproductive health. Uh, he is um, an international development. He had extensive experience in driving complex programs in deployment, monitoring and evaluation, strategic planning and management in monitoring and evaluation uh, in uh, multiple countries. Uh, Dr. Morish has uh, over 17 years experience developing and delivering organizational strategies with extensive experience of complex management and governance issues. He strongly believes that it is through primary health care uh, that universal health coverage can become a reality in Africa. He also believes that through partnership and collaboration with all stakeholders at all levels from community level, government, private sector, and with support from the broader international community and donors, innovative, culturally sensitive, and appropriate solutions to Africa's health challenges can be found and fostered. Uh, our second uh, speaker for today is Dr. Kim Yu. Uh, she is a board certified in family medicine. Dr. Kim Yu is a national director for clinical and community partnership for Alidaid based in Orange County, California. Dr. Yu speaks internationally and trains family physicians, residents, and medical students on health equity, population health, value-based care, health IT, leadership, advocacy, disaster relief, social media, and physical, physician wellness. Dr. Yu currently serves as president of the Orange County chapter of the California Academy of Family Physicians. She also chairs Wonka Special Interest Group in Health Equity and is AAFP delegate to the AMA. She is past president of the Michigan Academy of Family Physicians. Hello, Dr. Kim. Uh, our uh, third... Uh, uh, speaker for today is Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi. Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi is an association, associate uh, professor in Duke's uh, Department of Family Medicine and Community Health and named North California's 2021 Family Physician of the Year by the North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, the honor is the most prestigious award from the NCAFP. She is states, uh, the state's largest specialty medical association, comprised of more than 4,300 members. Uh, Dr. Martinez Bianchi, a family physician uh, committed to health equity in her community and around the world. Uh, she serves as director of health equity for the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the Duke University. She is uh, the co-founder um, uh, of the Latinx advocacy team and interdisciplinary network for COVID-19, better known as Latin 19. The group was established in March, March of 2020 to address inequalities in, COVID, in the COVID-19 pandemic response, uh, the health system in general, and communities in Central North Carolina. Uh, prior to becoming Director of Health Equity, Dr. Martinez Bianchi served as Program Director for the Duke Family Medicine Residency uh, Program. Hello, everyone, and uh, we are great, very honored to having you today. So we shall start our uh, presentation, uh, please, uh, with Dr. Viviana, I think, or Dr. Kim. Philippe, okay. I thought it was Dr. Mar Marish first. Dr. Marish. Yes, um, I can Dr. Start. Marish, please go ahead and um, share okay. your screen. Okay. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Rawia. I hope you can see my screen. Um, yes, we can see it clearly. Um, just a request to put it in um, slideshow mode now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh, are you, are you able to see it? Yes, we are, oh, but right. it is not in slideshow mode. Um, it appears to be having a challenge. It's um yes, it's fine. Uh, or let me try and uh, let me share it from my side. Yeah, please, please do. Okay. Just a minute. I can try to share it on my side. So. Okay, go ahead, Ravia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so can you hear my, see my slide now? Yeah? Yes. yes. Yeah. Just need to go to presentation mode. Uh, presentation mode. So uh, you can see it right now. Yeah, but we need you to enlarge your screen. Huh? This is the largest thing. Or share it as, you know, I think you're not sharing the whole window. Okay. So we try it now. Yes. Yes, good. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, just... Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for attending this uh, workshop. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited to, to talk in this workshop. Uh, we are grateful for the collaboration that we have with uh, Afro PSC. Uh, and I'm Ref Health Africa. I'm the country manager for Hamra Health Africa based in South Sudan, Juba. As Zahalia introduced, my name is Maurice Ojok, and uh, right now I'm in Juba. So today I'll focus my presentation on the community-centered health system as a vehicle to, uh, for primary health care uh, to achieve uh, universal health coverage. I'm taking into consideration all the aspects of health disparities and health inequalities that I experience in various uh, uh, places in Africa, uh, different communities. We know that there are a number of factors that contribute to that, but uh, I'll, I'll center my presentation on, the, on how community-centered health systems can help to uh, overcome some of those uh, challenges that we face in Africa. First and foremost, uh, we are, uh, know that uh, primary health care as laid out in the 1978 Al-Mahata Declaration is key to the attainment of the goal of health for all, which is uh, uh, more or less like health equity for everybody in, the, in, in, in Africa. Uh, recognizing health as a human right as well, and, uh, and also uh, emphasized in the Astana Conference of 2018, which further recognized the need to strengthen primary health care to address health inequalities in the different communities. Uh, 
uh, why 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 community health uh, community centered health systems now uh, systematic review of uh, by WHO revealed that uh, primary health care contributes to improving health outcomes for different groups in the community and also health systems efficiency and health and contribute to health equity uh, to make primary health care uh, practices effective in achieving these outcomes and make primary health care a robust vehicle for delivering of uh, universal health coverage, we need to deliberately invest in integrated community centered care, which puts people first and uh, communities at the center of the health system. Uh, the human centered design embraces embraced by the 69th World Health Assembly in 2016, also calls for fundamental shift in funding management coordination and delivery of primary health care services, which is a strong pillar in addressing inequalities in the different uh, community settings. And we know that inequality in health differs by uh, groups and differs by location, geographical location, the economic conditions of people, uh, the environment where people live and all that. So key, the key is to actually reimagine the house system building blocks to deliberately address primary health care system barriers and serve the health needs of communities with people and communities engaged as agent of transformation. Uh, next slide, please move the slides. Transforming each of the systems building blocks to be community centered will help address vulnerabilities and also inequality in, uh, in, the, in, in primary health care uh, service provision. Uh, to make uh, the primary health care uh, a robust vehicle for uh, delivering universal health care coverage and also address the issues of inequality, we need to uh, have health programs uh, focus on the community's needs, not on the diseases, and making the health system centered around the community needs. And uh, the such shifts will call uh, for the different stakeholders in the health service provision uh, to adapt and transform each of the health system building blocks and, and make it community centered and put the community first. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I want to give an example of, the, for example, the human resources for health. How do we overcome inequalities? To illustrate uh, community health centered, community centered health system consideration, we have to, uh, the countries need to move the human resources for health towards being more community centered by addressing questions of uh, how we co-create health, human resources for health solutions with health workers and also through the human-centered design with the health workers at the core of such uh, uh, solutions. Uh, we also need to work with the health workers and their leaders to foster a convenient and positive experience for clients who seek care in the public sector and also in the health facilities. We have to enable and motivate health workers to understand the role of social, cultural norms and household economic context when engaging with the clients or with the people while providing care. And also we, uh, we have to realize that the health system uh, should build the capacity of community-based health workers, such as the community health workers and the other organizations and strengthened the systems for primary health care beyond just service delivery. We have to uh, also understand the trends, uh, the trends that affect human resources for health and how our African countries can leverage on such trends to innovate and to ensure that human resources for health is centered 
on the needs of the health workers and the needs of the communities who uses the services. Uh, standard and tools need to be redesigned and developed to entrench in the health system to make this shift reality. Next slide. And uh, when, similarly, when we look at the health financing in the African context and also in the African health system, we need to respond to questions of uh, the role of people in health budgeting process uh, at the national and the subnational level. How can we empower communities to have a voice and uh, to seek accountability themselves and also to hold the policy makers and the, the implementers accountable for the services that are being offered to them. And, and also, we need to create an enabling environment for health facilities at the subnational level to have financial resources that they need to offer the health services and also guarantee the quality of those services for the community. Ensure there are no commodity, uh, for example, commodity stockouts. How do we rally the community to ensure that such is, uh, is taken into consideration while uh, 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 supporting uh, primary health care service delivery? How well uh, can we find, what kind of financial arrangements can we make uh, for the primary health care uh, level facilities to uh, protect uh, the poor people from, or, or the poor from accessing and uh, quality services and accessing services. What are the things that uh, the healthcare financing and how can African countries leverage on trends that are affecting the financing of the healthcare services at the community level and address the healthcare financing needs based on community uh, engagement needs, uh, community needs and engagement with the communities to, 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 to take in their views and their voice in, in, in such uh, in interventions. Working with stakeholders, including the health workers themselves, communities, to also co-create some of the solutions or answers to the type of questions and uh, uh, approaches and methods being deployed at the primary healthcare uh, level, enabling the environment for community-centered approach to in, uh, delivering of services and also to the de development of interventions and uh, at the community level. Next, please. Without shifting from uh, the current uh, health system design, health systems will become increasingly fragmented, inefficient, and unsustainable. Africa will bear the heaviest burden of such fragmentation and inefficiency, and, and, and we will continue to see uh, the, the, the existence of those disparities within the communities and within the uh, health system. Uh, catastrophic effects of the ability of the continent to afford health services for its more than 1 billion people will continue to be experienced if we don't shift from, uh, if we don't shift to community-centered health system design and also health system interventions. Uh, the, the good news is that most of the countries have embraced this shift and we now need to map the shift, improve areas where there are weaknesses, connect the shift to our policies, health programs, and catalyze application at scale. Uh, this, was a, this will enable uh, uh, African countries to achieve uh, universal health care and also address issues of inequalities. Next, please. So uh, what is a co community-centered health system? The idea is that people interact with each of the health system building blocks. The system building blocks also interact with the people. It should always be a partnership. Partnering with communities is the sure way sustainable health solution can be found. The mapping could entail extracting and mapping standards uh, of how uh, in institutions, uh, government facilitates each of the system building blocks to be centered on communities, translating standards and approaches into internal guidelines, training curriculum, practitioner models, and other landmark 
publications that would help to foster this idea. Work with the stakeholders to strengthen house systems across Africa, do more of what uh, the uh, countries have been doing to address issues of inequalities uh, while innovating and breaking new grounds. Uh, documentation is very important in this, uh, for this to, to happen. And, and, and for this to be propelled and defined community-based approaches that are workable, that provide uh, sustainable solutions to healthcare challenges that the African communities face. Next, please. So the unique value that we see in the community-centered health systems are that uh, it leapfrogs progress towards universal health coverage and sustainable development goals. Uh, it confronts the deepest and most uh, pervasive health problems that uh, developing countries are facing. Uh, issues of climate uh, health related issues, the neglected uh, tropical diseases, uh, the, the NCDs and mental health issues. Uh, improving the effectiveness of the equity of health systems through people-centered approaches will also help in addressing inequalities in healthcare uh, delivery at the primary healthcare level. Uh, protecting uh, people through gains in economic productivity and cost effectiveness of the health system, the community health systems will help us to achieve that. The formative guidance of government and development agencies and their quest to make smarter investments can only be fostered through community-centered approaches and community-centered health system thinking. Uh, training institutions can also catalyze change by producing graduates and uh, health workers who are practitioners in community-centered health systems and community-centered health solutions. Next, please. Uh, so to conclude my presentation is that uh, I, I conclude by this quote uh, from Lao Tzu. Go to the people, live with them, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build with what they have. But with the best leaders, when the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say, we have done it. So community health centered, uh, community centered health system is a true vehicle towards universal, is a robust vehicle towards universal health care. And also it will go a long way in helping to address health inequalities at the primary health care level. Next, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for listening. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I had uh, prepared for today's uh, discussions. There are some discussion questions that we will explore more on how community health uh, centered health system can help in addressing uh, health inequalities in primary health care. Thank you very much. Over to you. We do thank you very much, Dr. Maurice. It was a very interesting uh, introduction to the community-based uh, healthcare. And um, now we can uh, move to uh, the other slide. Okay, thank you. Are you seeing the correct screen? Just making sure. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, okay. thank you um, for the prior introduction. Thank you for that great initial um, speech. Um, we are thankful to, um, we are Viviana Martinez Bianchi and, and Kim Yu. We are thankful to Afro PhD for honoring us with the invitation to give this presentation. And thank you to all of you for all the very hard work that you are doing. Um, for Africa and the world. We are passionate about health equity. We, that we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. We are both family doctors doing health equity work in our places of employment. I personally spent 
50% of my time doing health equity work and 50% of my time seeing patients at your family medicine and community health. Um, and prior to this, I was uh, for five years um, as a volunteer, but uh, working with the World uh, Organization of Family Doctors and the liaison to the World Health Organization. These are the goals and objectives that we hope to cover today. Our hope is that through our talk, you will learn or relearn or be reminded of some key concepts surrounding health equity and factors of vulnerability, intersectionality, and unconscious bias that you will feel comfortable using a um, health equity and empowerment lens and use several frameworks and case studies to understand and mitigate bias. And that we can hopefully um, inspire you to start working in health equity in your own community or continue working in health equity or not feeling so lonely doing this work, knowing that there are others that are really working very hard um, and that through our words, you will know that you are not alone. In 1978, the Alma Ata Declaration identified health as a human right and primary health care as the key to attainment of the goal of health for all. In 2018, world health leaders converged to Astana, Kazakhstan, during the 40th anniversary of the Declaration of Alma Ata to the Global Conference on Primary Health Care. Dr. Tedros, Director General of the WHO recognized that during the conference that we must acknowledge that we have not achieved the vision of Amata and that instead of health for all, we have achieved, which have achieved health for some. He spoke about how countries and health systems have failed to meet the proposed items of the first declaration, saying loudly health is a political choice and the choices need to be made at every level and in every decision. And making a call to action to achieve universal health coverage and renew the commitment to strong primary health care in every country. And I'm glad that we're all here together today. I stood in front of this poster at the United Nations 11 years ago, reading this quote from the Declaration of Human Rights and thinking how far we are from this to be our current reality. How many people around the world are not truly free? How many are victimized and not considered equal in dignity and rights? Many roots of health disparities are linked to leaders not seeing the dignity of people's lives and not addressing basic health needs, basic social determinants. It, they become determinants of poor health because they're not being addressed. I would like to highlight that when we talk about health equity and disparities, we can see differences in how each person looks at the world, what lens we use, how we are, and where we grow up, our cultural, religious values will often influence how we see the moon or health in this case. Let's start with health equity and the definition. And I like Dr. Kamara Jones' definition of health equity because it invites us to action. Health equity is a process of assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. And so she invites us that in this definition, we are required to do at least three things. One, value all individuals and populations equally. Two, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. And three, providing resources according to need. In equitable cultures, all persons can have similar choices. But can, what can we do when we live in, world, in a world where the circumstances are stacked up so differently for different members of our communities. What do we do to move towards a continent of justice, of equity, a world of justice and equity, especially in equity and justice in health with access, access for all? So we can start with our own personal values. Throughout my life, I have strived to be a living expression of my values. I wear them, I speak them, I make decisions aligned with the value of health equity. Health equity is a personal value that has marked my life. And I, if you're listening to this session, I am sure that health equity is a value for you too. Working hard to elevate people's voices. See, 
every person, every community has a voice and a story to tell. The issue is who is listening, who is able to listen, or who decides to take the time to understand the language of the voices of the community. Listening with our hearts and seeking to engage. Doing effective advocacy, we must professionally learn how to influence equity decisions within our clinics, our health and social systems, our research institutions, communities and countries. Influencing policy to make a difference. There are multiple models for strategies for changing our health systems. Frameworks like this one from the National Institute for Healthcare Management in the US that I often use. It is embedded in my mind and soul to make sure that we always work on improving access to culturally competent care, that we recruit people from the communities we serve, that we provide anti-racism training, that we improve bi-directional health literacy. The understanding here that we often talk about patients' poor health literacy without ever taking a moment to see if we as doctors or healthcare teams and educators are literate about our patients' perception of health and illness. Do we know what the literacy of the community is? And are we understanding it? Are we literate enough to see it? Supporting community health workers and federally qualified health centers and community centers as described by Maurice in the prior talk and working with the community to build trust. There are competencies increasingly that link professionalism and health equity, addressing social determinants of health, looking at historical and current contexts. Health equity work requires an acknowledgement of power and privilege, including within the organizations that lead this work. You can find this table in our Society of Teachers of Family Medicine journals article addressing family medicine's capacity to improve health equity. These were ground rules for health equity conversations and work. The idea of the importance of creating safe and respectful environments for all members to contribute their feelings, their stories and perspectives in their style and approach, leveraging on building the contributions of each member to create better outcomes and so forth. Health equity in education matters greatly. We want to train ourselves and our learners as comprehensives or upstreamists, seeing the idea of river that Dr. Risi Menchanda talks about, training as health professionals who when we see the river of disease that flows into our clinics and hospitals, we will go to identify what is happening as upstream systematically understanding and addressing the social determinants of health and bringing that understanding into the workforce and the workflow of clinical care. Training ourselves and our learners to understand factors of vulnerability, learning how to ask our patients about those factors, recognize the needs and connect people to local resources, including them in the design of our research proposals, our clinics and community work needs to include the community. At the core of the inequities is the concept of intersectionality, the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class and gender regarded as overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage and the need to identify the advantages and disadvantages that are felt by people due, a combina due to a combination of factors, including racism, ethnophobia, homophobia, misogyny, and sentiments against people with different abilities or size. Learning how to use a trauma-informed lens we want to train our, ourselves and, and our learners as people who can listen to an immigrant story and understand that there might be a culturation stress, that the story might be more complex than initially understood. Respecting, learning about and understanding people's identities is providing dignity to the individuals and communities that we serve. We must also recognize that racism is a pandemic. We all need to strive to eradicate as hard as we're working to eliminate SARS-CoV-2 and other infectious diseases because pandemics spread 
all around the world. We have to fight against racism. As we look at all the areas in which to start working, we sometimes need to figure out one way to get started. And we can start looking at health equity and accountability. I like using this chart that looks at Boland's social obligation sale, scale for medical institutions. When we compare healthcare institutions and medical schools to Boland's social obligation scale, we see that healthcare institutions are, are generally socially responsible. They are aware of their duty to respond to society's needs. Now, some do a little bit better and can be seen as seen as uh, be seen as being socially responsive meaning that they are implementing interventions to address the needs of the community that they are inspiring their objectives from data and they are community based but few institutions are socially accountable really acting as positive change agents in the community, defining their institutional objectives together with society, creating educational programs in context with local needs, and acting as health partners in the assessment of their contributions. Literature on social accountability generally revolves around advocacy for vulnerable populations whose voice at the table is most likely to be dismissed critical to social accountability models is an emphasis on the redistribution of power to assure that there is a fair and effective inclusion and response to the needs and interests of underserved stakeholders, making sure that there is always community participation. We like to use the health equity and empowerment lens adapted from racial equity practitioner Sonali Balaji from Multnomah County in Oregon. The lens uses five P's to be paid attention to for issues and decisions, focusing on impact in the areas of people, place, process, and power. Under the first P for people, we ask that at every decision, we need to start thinking who is positively and negatively affected by this issue and how. Who are the people in my community most likely to be vulnerable to the issue? What are the physical, spiritual, emotional, and contextual effects related to the issue? And how do we, how do people perceive the barriers? Let's have a reminder of those factors leading to increased vulnerability. I like this graph from the World Health Organization that looks at those factors, and especially what you need to look for in times of emergency management and crisis, crisis response. Like on, which are the, the areas most vulnerable. And if we think of the pandemic response that was very hospital-centric, we can start realizing how a lot of these factors of vulnerability were not really paid attention to in the design of the pandemic. Let's go to P, this next P, process. How are we meaningfully including or excluding people, refugees, minority communities, disabled, non-English, or non-language proficient, um, rural, incarcerated, who are affected? What clinical or system processes and social relationships contribute to the exclusion of communities most affected by inequities? And then what empowering processes can we initiate? The creation of a multi-sector partnership is one of the best models known to improve health equity. The next under this lens is the place. What kind of positive place are we creating? What kind of negative place are we creating? How are resources and investments distributed? How are you considering environmental impacts and environmental justice in the design of your interventions? And now let's go to power. What are the barriers? to doing equity and racial justice work for our clinic, our health system, our organization. Is there enough support? We can continue to assign this work to volunteers. I am faculty in a department that values the work I do with 50% of my time dedicated to the role of director for health equity. And then think about what are the benefits and burdens that communities experience with this issue? And lastly, who is accountable? And for the last P, uh, for purpose. 
It highlights the importance that in a purpose-driven system, all partners at all levels align around transformative values with relationships and goals moving towards health equity, integrating an emphasis on preventing harm and supporting actions that lead and transform. What is our institution's purpose towards health equity, should we ask it? How are we clearly defining that purpose? And where and how do we communicate the purpose? in our definitions. How can we ensure that our purpose is integrated into our policies, procedures, and practices? How can we give team members a greater sense of meaning and belonging in what they or we do around health equity so we all and they all feel more enthusiastic and hopeful about the work that we are doing? Remember that inequities are harmful. In what practical ways can our institutions add more value around health equity and prevent harm? Do we have the right people and plans to achieve the purpose? And if not, how can we move to this reality? And how do we ensure individuals work together with leaders to align our purpose towards health equity? Like Maurice said before, are we involving community in how we do? Dr. Kim Yu will speak next about addressing bias. Kim. Thank you so much, Viviana. Um, and a lot of what uh, Viviana spoke about can be seen within the context of this whole healthcare ecosystem. And you can see here within, whether it's in the healthcare system, the policies that are in place, whether it's in the organization that you work at, the infrastructure and the systems, or in the individual practice where you work, the culture and procedures, that there is this area between the physician and patient that includes bias, that includes cultural competency. And you can see the areas that are under the patient there, adherence, trust, and satisfaction. All of these areas really help build health equity across a healthcare ecosystem. And yet that bias piece just plays one small part. And we're going to talk a little bit more about bias over the next few minutes to really uncover the differences there. Next slide. So let's look at how do we really address bias in your practice or where you work? What is it? Well, bias really is um, this definition here, um, if you look at bias versus conscious bias versus unconscious bias, bias is when someone is prejudiced in favor or against one thing, person or group compared to another. It's usually considered to be unfair. And conscious bias or racism is characterized by overt negative behavior that can be expressed through physical and verbal harassment. It's what we often will recognize as a race, race, racial or racist slur or someone saying something or doing something that is very overt, that you know that that's not right. Unconscious or implicit bias is very hidden in many ways, and it really is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. It really operates outside of our awareness and run counter to what we may expressly believe. And we all have them. We all have implicit biases. Just because you have implicit bias doesn't make you a bad person. Um, and we need to uh, be aware of our own blind spots in order to help address our blind spots and understand implicit bias. It really, you know, when I think about implicit bias, it really is how we communicate with our world, how we see our world, how we view our world. And there are different ways in which you can mitigate implicit bias. These are just a few, and we'll look at more as we go on. One way is to understand where you personally sit with and have um, self-awareness of your own implicit biases. And one way you can do that is by taking the project implicit test. Um, it's online at this um, link here and uh, taking the social perspective of others test that um, I will share later as well. 
building empathy is a wonderful way of being able to understand others and to understand others' perspectives and to build understanding of others' viewpoints. When we also develop and practice mindfulness, that also helps us develop self-regulation. Oftentimes, implicit biases will rear um, its ugly head in many ways when we are rushed, when we're busy. Um, this has been played out in multiple medical studies, including in emergency rooms or in places where they're seeing many patients um, in high volume and high acuity patients. And we need to understand that having mindful techniques that help us self-regulate and slow down helps us understand and ensure that we're not being um, having implicit bias um, affect our reasoning. Understanding and having goals that activate fairness and equality and using guidelines to help base our treatments is very important also to mitigate implicit bias. And then collecting counter stereotypical information. There may be ideas that one may have. Um, when you see me, who do you see? You see an Asian woman. If we were in person, you would say, she's a short Asian, Asian woman. And maybe you would think, oh, maybe uh, I'm not good at sports or um, I must be good at math or, you know, things like that. And so it's important that we collect counter stereotypical information, information that is against what the stereotype might be. And so collecting information of famous Asian artists, for example, or dancers or whatever it might be that is different from what you may expect of a short Asian female. And then the last part is understanding culture and really spending time to understand the culture, wherever it might be in your country, in your place of work, wherever you in your community. Understanding that culture is so vital to mitigate bias. This is um, the, the self-assessment survey that you can take, and it is um, available for free at the AFP website. And um, I often encourage, if you're in an organization, to do this together with your um, staff. And you can complete this handout. And if we have time later in our breakouts, you can actually do this test. And you can do this very well on a Zoom. It works actually quite well, where if you think about it, you do this test and you total your score, and you have everyone in your Zoom you know, uh, session right now, there's 19, 20 of us in this Zoom, you'd have 19 boxes and you turn all your cameras on. And then as you talk through this survey, you can say, okay, for those who have a score more than um, or less than five, switch your camera off, less than 10, switch your camera off, less than 15, et cetera, et cetera. And you see who's left. And it's very interesting when you do this test with others. Um, I took this test with my husband. Um, when I first did it, my first score was less than 10. And my husband's score was 15. And it was interesting just between the two of us to understand how do we view the world? Um, when you think of questions like, if I walk into an emergency room, I can be expected to be treated with dignity and respect. Or if I walk towards a security checkpoint in an airport, I can feel that I will not be looked upon as suspect. My age adds to my credibility. You know, things like all of these types of questions can really give you a very good understanding of how do you perceive the world and how do you feel? Um, the other test there, the Project Implicit Association test uh, is listed there also. And also the Identity Science Walk. If we were in person, I know that Viviana um, uh, has done this. Um, with many different uh, workshops that we've done together also, where you can walk between signs that we hold up, there'll be signs that may say um, different things um, for how a, a person may identify with in different groups. Um, and you walk between the different signs. And it's a very powerful reminder of that we are all different, that we view the world differently, and yet there is a collective understanding that we need to have and to share to be able to better take care of all of our patients. 
Next slide. One way also in which we can address and understand implicit biases is the use of case studies. And here I list out um, a way in which you can do this. Um, one is by sharing, for example, a photograph. And here you see a photograph of a very cute baby uh, being held uh, by, it appears to be maybe a female. Um, and, you know, when you think about this picture, what do you see? What could be happening to this baby, to this person holding the baby? Who is the person holding the baby? You know, why is the baby holding, um, why is the baby uh, wearing a hat? Um, what are the services that this baby may need? And so you can show photographs similar to these and ask the people that you're with in a classroom or if you're with students, medical students, uh, community health workers, nursing staff, whoever you may be with, how would you react? What do you do in this situation? How do you approach this patient? What do you do if you do not address the needs for this baby? Uh, maybe this baby needs um, support with food. Um, and what does it mean if you don't provide services for this child? for example. Um, and so what resources are you going to develop or have for this patient and what action steps will you take? So really important to use case studies that are applicable to your area and your community, um, but also to share what are the biases that may actually come up and crop up um, in viewing this patient or in viewing the care that this baby has had, are there biases that may be occurring that others may not know or see? I know when I first saw this picture, I did not really recognize that maybe something is happening with the hat. And I had a um, a mother of um, of a child who also had issues with with their hair. Um, that would always put their their child in a hat, or maybe it was housing and heating and needing to keep the baby warm. There are lots of different things that may be happening for this child that may be above and beyond what we initially see. So how do we uh, view view our patients in a different lens? This is a really interesting study that was done that showed that if you have increasing awareness of your biases, but no motivation, there is no reduction in implicit bias. If you have increased awareness, you've taken the self, you know, the project implicit test, you have high motivation, but you're really concerned that someone's watching you and evaluating you on your biases, you also will not be able to prevent the expression of implicit bias. It is only when you have increased awareness and also a high internal motivation to change and egalitarianism that you want to change, that you see the importance and need for change with your biases to address health equity at the much broader level that you are able to successfully reduce implicit bias for yourself. So again, other things that you can do, um, five other strategies we talked about, counter, collecting counter stereotypical information, individuating is where you don't say, oh, you all are like this, right? It is more about individually taking care right at the individual level and taking perspectives of the other person ensuring that you have contact with other people groups and practicing all of these different strategies. I was once asked to teach at WHO and um, given 10 minutes to talk about implicit bias. And we need to understand that even in this situation, it's not a one and done. We need to continue to come back and talk about implicit bias. Enhancing your practice's health equity lens, and we're going to move through the next section much faster. So um, I encourage you to look at these slides later, is really thinking about how we view our world and practices. Is it through a lens that is like this one, upside down, or are we right side up? And so let's move forward. How do you really build that plan to increase and enhance your health equity lens? And what systems do you have in place to ensure that social determinants are addressed at patient visits? And what resources do you have? Do you consider the social accountability 
that Dr. Viviana mentioned earlier. There are practice assessments that are available, and you can see them on the next slide, where we talk about um, how do we really evaluate your own practice. Next slide. So there are um, looking at your environment and workflow, looking how your patients go through your practice, and really looking at what would be your implementation plan. All of these are resources that are available that you could adapt for your community and for where you work to really address social determinants. When I think of practices and developing their health equity lens, it starts with where the patient walks in from the waiting room is the room in which you are working or the space that you're in, whether it's in the community health center or a clinic or out um, outside, outdoors, wherever it might be, does it really reflect the diversity of the community? Is the language available that you need? Do you have um, telehealth services that is available or not? Are there resources for um, the patients right where you need it? Are you able to do home visits? And what are the social needs assessments that you're doing and resources available for those patients with differing social, economic, and medical needs? There are ways in which you can think about interpersonal relationships between the communication, between the staff and the patients, really having transparency in data that might be available to you and identifying implicit bias and addressing it. When I think about understanding our communities, there are uh, different ways in which we do this also. Next slide. The social determinants of health, which are those conditions in which people grow, live, work, and play, can be seen in these two different metaphors and, and um, allegories, right? And the first one is the fishbowl metaphor, and it was uh, coined by Keyes and Galea in 2016, which looked at how um, in a fishbowl, the, the health of that goldfish, and I have a goldfish downstairs and their fishbowl does not look healthy right now, but if, if I were to think of that goldfish and the type of health that that goldfish may have, if if the, the bowl is broken or if the water is, is not clean, like how does that affect the health? And is the goldfish able to really have the best health um, with the surroundings of that fishbowl the way it is. In The Gardener's Tale, which is by Dr. Kamara Jones that was uh, quoted by Dr. Viviana earlier, um, The Gardener's Tale is a tale about uh, a gardener who has two um, flowers, one that is pink and one that's red, and he favors one flower over the other. And you can imagine if you're giving more fertilizer and water to one flower rather than the other, one flower will do better. Likewise, that is a um, allegory for racism and how the world uh, views um, in that lens, right? And so what do we do as, as clinicians to really promote and ensure that all our gardens have the care that they need. Next slide. So really who is the gardener in your practice? How does the community where your practice exists affect your patient's health? And what role do we play in helping our practices thrive in helping our patients thrive? This is a question that really in many ways um, helps one think about, well, how much of one's health is determined by one's postal code? This is a zip code in the United States, but in the United States and in other countries, it's been borne out very similar numbers. If you were to say you can put a number in the uh, in the uh, a letter, what do you think? How much health is determined by a postal code or um, the community in which you're at, different communities, different cities in which you live? Which one would it be? What does one think? And we'll move forward uh, since I'm not seeing any, but um, it's around 60% of one's health is determined by a zip code or postal code. Uh, many times this thing, this little uh, 
photograph here says health has no zip code. That's our goal, right? Is that health shouldn't have a zip code. We shouldn't be able to tell how sick or well one is by where you live. Unfortunately, that is not true. And that we know that affluence and um, the conditions in which one lives can affect the chronic conditions um, that that uh, a patient may have. And so there are ways in which you can understand the communities, and these are in different parts of the world. There are different directories that are available. It may be hospital rankings in your country. It may be other ways in which you rank health. Um, and it's important to be able to use those to help really determine what may be the barriers and social determinants in your um, area. And so this is an example um, that, that I share only because it's important to think of what are the things that you could build where you're at to really show and have data that's very transparent that shows how many percent of patients are really smoking or having obesity or having high blood pressure or diabetes, et cetera. And this is a resource um, for the United States where we can put in a zip code or a postal code and show um, which areas are the most unhealthy. The areas that are green are, are more healthy and the ones that are red or more orange are less healthy. And um, this has been a wonderful resource to be able to really pin it, go and hone in in those communities and know that that's the area where we need to do more services. So understanding the needs of your community, getting COVID data, looking at the data and seeing areas of inequalities and looking at what are some strategies to change this. And this is some of the questions that we're going to be asking in our breakouts um, as we move forward. And we'll move forward quickly through, the, through all of this to the final slide. So I do want to just ask um, that you get involved, whether it be in this Afro PHC, in your local area, in um, other institutions, but also in Wonka's Health Equity Special Interest Group. And in terms of advocating for health equity in your practice and community, these are some of the things that you can do, whether it's small, medium, or large, things that you may want to do, whether it's implicit bias training um, and practice assessments, ensuring that you continue to be curious and use and seek out data for your communities to be able to look at um, the disparities that occur, to share your concerns with others, to do more equity training and have inclusive policies at your place of work, um, ensuring those warm handoffs to community services. So we'll talk more about this. And I just wanted to share um, a little bit about the Wonka Special Interest Group on the Health Equity. Invite you all to join. Um, you uh, can join here using this QR code and different things that we've been doing in the past year and our future plans, um, including having a health equity virtual conference and having some awards and developing that health equity statement that I look forward to working with Afro PHC and developing with you, um, you know, what is it that as Wonka, we want to be able to put out as a health equity statement. So I'm going to stop there and move forward as we go on um, and pass this back to Viviana. Indigenous and immigrant together we stand tall. Our histories are relevant and injury to one is an injury to all. Recognizing that if one person is injured, one person is feeling the burden, the weight of inequities, we're all injured at the same time. It's not just that one person or that one community. For the leaders in the room, I say to you, why are you here? Why are we all here? What is our commitment to health equity? We need to be role models, asking about health equity at a systems level, checking in about this, setting up accountability system. So it's not based on one individual remembering to do something or that one individual, individual always pointing the health equity issues occurring in the community. Making sure that you know who is at your decision making table, who is included in and excluded in the care we provide. Are we being inclusive in our decisions? Perhaps one of the most significant things we can know about ourselves is to understand our own system of values. Almost everything we do is a reflection of our own personal value system. Is health equity part of your story? 
What is your story? Are you living your values? Is health equity the person that you're going to work with? Thank you for your participation. We look forward to um, working together. And remember that it is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man, a woman, these were words by Robert Kennedy, each time a man, a woman, or they stand up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustices, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring. Those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Through the education we provide to our learners and all the work that we're doing in our health systems and all we learn anew, may we all continue to send forth ripples of hope to reach each other, the states, the nations, and the world. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Viviana. Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, a lot of thanks to you, Dr. Maurice. Um, it was very uh, enlightening presentations, and I learned a lot from this. I really looking forward to seeing you in person in the near future, I hope. Uh, so uh, after this, we will move to the breakout rooms. Um, mercy can. Uh, in the chat box, Mercy uh, shared with us the uh, the group questions. Uh, that's just, in your experience, what are the factors that have contributed to health disparities and inequities in the access and delivery of the primary health care um, from an, a community perspective, a healthcare worker uh, service delivery perspective? And what are the some solutions you would recommend addressing these gaps and promote uh, health equity? Uh, these are the group uh, questions for us. Uh, before we open the breakout rooms, can if anyone would like to uh, have a comment or question in this uh, presentation, uh, kindly raise your hand and we can uh, so we can uh, answer this question. And thank you. So uh, if and no one has, uh, I think there's something in the chat box. Okay. Um, I think no questions for now. We can move to the breakout rooms. If you have anything to add, Dr. Maurice, uh, Dr. Viana, uh, Kim. I know it is very hard time for you. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're looking forward to, the, to talking with the others and hear um, our colleagues' opinions. Yeah, yeah. Having an interactive session is a very uh, useful way for us. Um, thank you so much, um, Rawia, Dr. Viviana, and Kim Yu, and Maurice. Those have been wonderful presentations. Um, we have uh, a few people have left, so we are going to have just two breakout rooms. So I'm going to send you the breakout rooms, and then maybe I'll have uh, uh, Dr. Viviana and Kim Yu in separate rooms, and um, then if, uh, you can pair up with uh, Maurice and Rawia. So I'm going to open up the rooms right now. So all you need to do is click and go to your assigned room. So I'm going to assign you to rooms now. Um, let me see, can you... Sana. Hata 
Hi, Alex. Uh, I don't think we need, um, we, uh, we'll need you in the breakout room. I think we'll have to do for now. Yes. Hello. Hello, Abraham. It's great meeting you all. Hello, everyone. Okay. So we have a, an assignment. I, I see Shabira Ali. And Chukar Haruna, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Well, where you are? Can you hear me? I'm Shabra Ali. Hello? Can you hear me? I feel like I can hear you.
Students in the group that was wonderful. Um, so over to you, Rawir. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, engaging me in this discussion. Uh, so uh, being back from the breakout room, we would like to uh, hear the feedback from, uh, let's start with room two, uh, if they are willing to, uh, to share their thoughts. Dr. Kim, with uh, you were in room two. Rawe, so, no, Rawe, we were room two. Yeah, we were room, yeah, room two. Okay, so start with room one because I would require the room. Uh, okay, okay, so room that's one. room one yeah. is um, we have Lillian um, who will be our reporter. Okay, thank you. So, Lillian. Uh, Thank you very oh, much, really? Ravia. Yes, Muiruri. Uh, so the factors we came up with from a community perspective, I'll just outline them and maybe just do some brief explanation where necessary. So one of them that we captured was uh, poverty. We reckon that in uh, most of the African countries, the poverty levels are quite high and that has really impacted or had a challenge in terms of access to primary health care amongst communities, environmental conditions in terms of uh, poor air quality, the effect of the climate change, which each and every one of us is really um, experiencing, is also having a serious uh, challenge in, and effect into accessing primary health care. Because in as long as we, we are not able to access the necessary um, energy, we are not able to access uh, various uh, food uh, issues that also affects our economy and so most families are not also able to access primary health care. Cultural issues in terms of norms, beliefs and values. Most of the African countries, we have various, uh, within the populations, we have different tribes that have different norms, beliefs and uh, values and uh, they also value certain activities differently. Most of the African uh, households are led by patriarchal systems where men are the heads of the houses and uh, this goes boils down into decision making as well. And some of the decisions, if uh, they are not given a go ahead from the man perspective, then especially the children and the women are also disadvantaged in terms of accessing uh, healthcare and especially the primary one that uh, is very near to the community level. Power imbalances have also come out uh, strongly as a hindrances to our communities in accessing healthcare. And this is embedded mostly onto those who hold leadership positions. And at some point for communities, uh, they are not able to overdo or overwrite what uh, the community leaders uh, propose. And therefore sometimes disadvantaging the communities in accessing healthcare unless they are advised to go ahead. And so we find that uh, those mostly in power, they access better healthcare than others, and hence the disparities. Unavailable infrastructure and structures within uh, communities and societies. Some areas are very remote in terms of physical infrastructure. Uh, we also have uh, structures put in place, being biased to those strong within the society, and therefore also uh, bringing disparities within access to primary health care within the communities. Behavior is also another aspect in terms of uh, behavior changes in various communities. We have African uh, communities experiencing different cultural aspects, having cultural beliefs that are different. We have cultural rights or the rights of passage that are experienced in some communities. 
and uh, we had the uh, examples we of uh, the Maasai that uh, we share within Kenya, Tanzania. We also have other communities that are in Kenya that strongly embed their culture and certain rights into their communities. And they have also contributed so much into the uh, prevalence and the incidence of certain uh, um, health challenges within those communities. And uh, advocacy is seriously required to ensure that at least we can be able to break that bond between some of the uh, unhealthy cultures that could uh, really deteriorate uh, the primary health care seeking behaviors amongst communities. Health policies is also uh, a major point whereby some policies are made in favor of certain groups or certain uh, people in communities, especially where we have middle class, high class levels and the lower class are uh, medium or lower than medium class levels. And therefore also having a hindrance into uh, access to primary health care. Retrust levels also came out uh, clearly amongst the population as a serious hindrance or a disparity into access to health care because uh, in as long as your literacy levels within the community are low, you may not see the impact or feel, have that advantage or feel the disadvantage of not accessing health care in time and the consequences it may have. And uh, therefore, uh, that also came up as a factor that uh, is contributing to uh, inaccessibility of primary health care. Um, under cultural differences, there is also the exclusion of people accessing health care, issues to do with social integration. We have uh, in different societies, we have various aspects of social integration. There are certain communities where men and women cannot uh, integrate or make decisions together, discuss solutions about their challenges together. And uh, those are things that need to be looked into because at some point they also impact into the health systems of the communities. Community integration and lack of support systems within those communities have also accelerated uh, the issues of uh, communities trying to overcome various shocks, whether disaster, violence, um, drought, flooding, and so many that are, are bedeviling our, our countries, especially in Africa. Community participation to programs is also identified as a very minimal in most of the African countries. Stress levels, and as we had uh, actually heard from the various uh, presentations that we've had in the day, we can attest with that tr stress is actually a health, uh, a chronic illness within our communities if left, if left unaddressed. And it is something that can also contribute to uh, disparities in access to primary health care. Exposure to violence and trauma and uh, also conflict is also something that uh, actually separates and uh, disintegrates communities and impedes access to healthcare. Justice policies that sometimes are, are, are formulated and uh, implemented tend to affect some communities in a negative way and therefore impeding access to healthcare as well. Language barriers, especially uh, in most African countries, we have tribes. And even within those tribes, we have uh, different dialects that are used in communication. But our health workers are trained across board. You can uh, be posted uh, to any part of the country, despite or irrespective of your ethnic um, upbringing. And uh, therefore, if, for instance, you're not very conversant with the language that is used within that community and you're dealing with retreat and semi retreat and illiterate persons within healthcare, it can also become a serious challenge in terms of uh, trying to have that patient and uh, a health professional relationship and conversation. Housing challenges, these are also really prominent in most African countries. 
and this has also contributed so much into access to primary health care and various effects. We know that most of our African countries, we have various regions that are highly populated and the housing structures are also not very uh, up to date. We have a lot of uh, slums um, and uh, this exposes the population to various health issues. And uh, it is due to the, because of their low incomes, they are also not able to access healthcare in the proper way. Unemployment rates within the African countries is quite high and it, it is also increasing by the day. And this has also been a factor that we identified as uh, affecting or contributing to communities uh, inability to access primary health care. Access to care also in terms of uh, finance, financial aspects. Definitely, if you're unemployed, you're also not able to adequately access care and in the proper way. Uh, some of the solutions that we suggest or propose for those challenges. Um, Ravi, I don't know whether I should continue to the solutions or we first of all deal with the factors. Yes, please. Yes, please. You can go to the solutions. Okay, fine. Thank you. So some of the policies that we have uh, suggested are uh, ensuring that the policies that are formulated are community centered in such a way that uh, by the time we are identifying uh, problems to be addressed, in terms of policy implications, we try to ensure that we understand what the communities need in terms of healthcare and uh, the kind of uh, uh, suggestions or solutions they would be willing to have. And being professionals, it is possible for us to sit down and come up with policies that are community-centered so that even as we come up with laws, and the uh, ideas of ensuring that we are managing the processes, we are also mindful of uh, the communities and we are sure that the communities will also be in acceptance to the various protocols that uh, are, are done, as well as the planning for interventions, which has really been an impediment even when programs are, are, are suggested within communities and the various partners even come up with intervention programs in communities, you find that due to uh, interventions being brought from the top of the, the ministries, especially with our African countries, most of our policy directives are, are, are decided from the headquarters and trickle down to the communities. And it becomes sort of an authoritarian sort of a process where the communities cannot be able to question or suggest any, any adjustments to the policies put in place then the reason we find communities drawing themselves out of the projects, sometimes abandoning them and also having an unacceptance to the, to the interventions that are put in place. Therefore, it would be important that we try and ensure that the policies we formulate are community-centered whereby um, one of our colleagues talked of a bottom-up approach listening to the communities, hearing their ideas, identifying their needs, and coming up with solutions that are embedded from the needs of the communities at hand. We would also suggest and recommend a focus on preventive medicine rather than curative healthcare um, and the promotion of health, therefore engaging communities and allowing them to participate. And also, uh, coming up with as many community outreach programs, education uh, programs to the communities to enhance their knowledge about uh, health, health promotion activities, how their environment can harm or positively um, upgrade their health status and so on. And uh, these can also be enhanced by ensuring that we also develop curriculums within our training institutions that can be used to train the health workers on how to educate the communities. We also have the community engagement and community involvement in those trainings to ensure that there is a buy-in of the communities into listening and accommodating the various aspects suggested. Uh, factors that uh, 
derived from a healthcare worker perspective that uh, impede or uh, uh, somehow facilitate uh, non access to community to primary uh, service delivery. We came up with a few, one of them being burnout due to uh, the patient health worker ratios. In most African countries, we have this challenge where a health worker is has a responsibility of looking into a large number of the community members, which are against the threshold of various uh, norms and practices among health workforce, including the World Health Organization. And it would be important to try and address this because it has really created a lot of poor service delivery, especially in terms of uh, trying to ensure that the health worker addresses or has is able to, to uh, see as many patients as possible. Because at the end of the day, from a humanitarian point of view, you don't want to leave so many on the queue just because either your time or your shift has elapsed. We also have professional stigmatization to patients which is a problem that was identified from the health worker perspective that sometimes deter access to primary health care. When you associate patients according uh, with their ailments, gradually that would push health seekers away slowly by slowly because as a person, you wouldn't want to go back to a facility where you are associated with your ailment. And this now boils down to uh, some bit of professionalism that did require to be uh, addressed. Language barriers amongst health workers also hinder access uh, to primary health care in terms of service provision, patient uh, health worker relationship because when you are in a society or in a community and you're not able to communicate with the clients who come in, then at some point you're not also able to give any services. Some of the solutions, um, we also have a health workers access to services in terms of distance. When the health workers are provided for shelter or they look for their own shelter and the, the distance between where they live and where they go to work in the health facilities is so far. And especially in areas where security is a challenge, then it also uh, affects negatively into the access of healthcare. Because say for instance, you're working in a facility that runs 24 hours and uh, you had already, you are supposed definitely to be on call and you're asked for assistance in the facility, but uh, the, 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 the road or the route to the health facility is not quite safe for you. You will definitely hesitate however much you would want to help. And through those delays, you know what happens at the end of the day. That uh, very, very crucial hour for a patient to save becomes really a problem. So some of the solutions that we suggested is focus on the placement of uh, health workers on community needs so that we also ensure that we are placing our health workers within areas that are accessible and within areas they can be able to reach within the shortest period or time possible and also consider the issues of speciality, areas of speciality. If, for instance, we have a health facility in a given region and we place health workers in it but did not consider the health needs of the population and take specialists whose uh, uh, much of the activities is not required there, then at some point we will really not be utilizing them as they should. And we have experienced that in most of the African countries. And this has also greatly uh, impeded the access to primary health care, whereby certain uh, specialized care, uh, when it comes to health workers, they are not available in certain hospitals and the referral systems become really a challenge. 
introduction to primary health drives or uh, to public health drives should also be um, something to be considered so that this helps in addressing various challenges facing health workers and also facilitate the interaction of health workers with, community, with communities. Access to language barriers, this can also be looked into. We could come up with strategies that can help us really address issues of language barriers. And I think so far, unless uh, Dr. Kim would add anything that I may have left out, those are some of the points, uh, challenges and solutions we were able to come up with in group one. Thank you so much, Lady, and it was incredible uh, reporting out there, and you didn't miss a single thing. Uh, I have nothing to add there, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you to um, Ambud. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lilian. As Dr. Kim said, you didn't uh, miss anything to report. Uh, it was very incredible listening to your presentation or reporting uh, back. Uh, I think you covered all the areas of the six pillars of the health systems. So it was very uh, enriching uh, presentations. I don't know what to say uh, next because you covered all of this. <laughs> I think I will be repeating the same point. So it is a common uh, issues in Africa uh, uh, as, as well. So I will go in a very fast uh, way. Um, really, Lilian didn't... Uh, left us something to say. So um, in order not to make it, uh, to have a lot of time with this, so I go very quickly. Uh, for sure, the, uh, the financial issues, the income, the weights, the low, the, the weights uh, uh, is very challenging for people. They cannot access the out of the box expenditure is a very challenging uh, uh, health issue facing the population. So people, they, differ from seeking medical advices if they are uh, with the, in the little low income countries. Uh, so uh, the quality of care uh, is depending on the size of, or the income. It's one of the main health disparities issues as rich families can access better care. And uh, poor, so uh, this is one of the social and the uh, health disparities. Uh, also, the knowledge that people are uh, in Africa, we know that uh, they uh, prefer much the traditional medicine. So uh, they uh, like to uh, seek the traditional or uh, medicine better than the conventional medicine. Uh, other issue was um, for sure the gender uh, that women cannot access medical uh, health care equity or they cannot seek medical advice because they cannot afford it or that is very far away from their area, so they cannot travel uh, to this. And this leads us to the inaccessibility of certain communities uh, because the, uh, they have to travel for a long, far, for far, far away to uh, seek for basic medical uh, 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 solution or medical advice. Uh, also, which there is the LGBTQ uh, community is cannot access care as well in many, many communities as for us in Sudan, it is, uh, it's just a bow. It is not, uh, cannot even speak of the, uh, the issues, even if they can, um, they may be discriminated for having their, uh, their care and they cannot speak up about their uh, medical issues. Um, uh, also, we see that the culture that affects the equity and the equality of uh, services provided, because uh, in some cultures, uh, it is not... Uh, <laughs> not okay. Uh, in some cultures, people, they do not uh, uh, need... They don't like to um, having uh, being being treated by young uh, uh, medical professionals, they uh, need just specialization, or they, uh, on the contrary, they like to have the traditional midwives or the uh, to to treat them other than this. Um, so the culture that this is about the religion, the uh, you know the uh, language and the native language spoken. Uh, so. Um, uh, they see, as we said, that the young professionals are inexperienced, so they prefer having the traditional uh, practitioner than them. Um, the inaccessibility of uh, 
care needs, the communities needed, that the, the people centered care, the community centered care is not uh, well developed, although it is just embraced in the um, policies and in the uh, all the um, regulations in the ministries, but it's not on the uh, ground, it is not uh, well uh, developed. And on, uh, uh, on the other hand, the political factor is very, um, the political instability affects the, uh, the, uh, the, the health situation of the health system in, in, uh, in many country, African countries are very uh, high uh, because it is underdeveloped countries. So the instability, the conflict areas, uh, people cannot, uh, be, it is a shared problem for the medical workers and for the people because they are not settled. So, and also the medical workers cannot, uh, they don't prefer working in such uh, areas. Um, so um, for the solutions, it's to what we can wrap up that we can say that primary healthcare education, community, uh, like uh, having community models that building capacity of um, the building capacity of uh, primary healthcare uh, co workers in the needed areas. Because when you, um, uh, resettle or uh, the uh, medical co-workers in their area, they cannot seek, uh, people will not seek uh, adv advices or medical in uh, services in, in, in big cities. Uh, motivating also co-workers to work in areas of needs that, that were like uh, have giving them better remuneration and uh, other, uh, we can say, um, additional, uh, benefits like housing, like uh, opportunities to uh, have a better specialization in the future. Uh, so uh, whatever it makes in them sense, uh, what, what motivates them better, you can apply to them. Uh, we need the government to improve the working environment, PHC, and making sure all necessary things needed for patients care supplied like drugs and human resources. and. Um, you cannot build a, a hospital without the having the HR the needed, the health uh, for health for health or the services for the facility to be done. Uh, and the main issue is that we can face it is the health uh, information or health data collection when implement uh, how we use this data for uh, better solutions for in the future. So having a very health information system and the collection of training staff to collect data and how to analyze it and how to present it in a, a better way uh, that uh, aids in the uh, better sol if the solutions needed is a key uh, solution. Also, um, I, uh, in the area of the traditional medicines, we can uh, educate big people of the dangers of the traditional drugs. Also, we can work in a way that have uh, the uh, the traditional medicine regulated and well trained and uh, educating the traditional uh, 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 health providers that the the uh, how with the safe uh, practices and uh, how to avoid the uh, toxic and invasive uh, practice. So and encouraging at the end we can encourage the policymaker to address issues to develop the uh, universal health coverage. Uh, I think and um, give better enumeration, as I said earlier, to uh, health workers. Uh, I think uh, this is what uh, we can add to what Liliana already said. Uh, if you would like to add something, Viviana, uh, you can. Uh, and thank you very much. No, excellent uh, recap, Rawia, and wonderful. The two teams did a wonderful job. I'm very excited to to have um, heard all of this. Yes, it's so fantastic to hear everyone's thoughts and ideas and coming up with solutions that really are very practical, but at the same time, um, very directive and um, I remember hearing, you know, one commenter who said the importance of ensuring that it is definitely bottom up rather than top down, that we go into our communities and really ask what it is that they need. And I think that that really um, 
strengthens our community so much more when we really address the needs from our communities. Um, I did put a link to some notes um, and they're by no means exhaustive. Please do add to them and we can share with the leaders. Um, thank you so much, um, Rawia, for moderating this session. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Kim, Bibiana, uh, Morish, uh, for joining us in this session. Um, as we are winding up, I would just like to give opportunity to anyone who has any question or comment from the participant, and then we can have a word uh, or a parting shot something like a take home message um, that you'd like the participants to go home with and then we'll wind up. So let me see if there are any hands raised. I do not see any raised hands from the participants. So I am going to start um, with you, Maurice, who opened up the workshop for us. If you have any parting shot or any take home message you'd like to give to our participants today. Uh, there's someone with a hand up, Abdu. Maybe you can go first. Masi? Hello, go ahead, Abdu. Yes. Madam, I'm just, just, it's just a question that I want to raise here. I don't know if, if is there is any certificate that you are going to provide with us that attended after this, this uh, program. Because it's going to take, uh, at least I, I can see, it's all about three to four days. Yeah. Um, the workshop is just for today, Abdu, and we normally do not issue certificates for these um, workshops because they're usually just for capacity building and also discussion and um, sharing of ideas. But so your it's much more of symposium. Yes, not not symposium, it's, it's but it's not a certificate. It is not a CPD workshop or a workshop that um, from which you gain a certificate. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you, uh, Marcy, and thank you all the participants uh, for this workshop. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to share ideas, to share uh, information on the uh, health disparities. And we all know that uh, over the years, there have been widening health inequalities in many parts of the world, including in Africa, which has really placed greater emphasis on the need to put communities at the heart of public health. Uh, this is further demonstrated by the role communities have played in improving health and ensuring uh, no communities left behind during the COVID pandemic period. Uh, we have seen it in different countries, in different uh, communities, and in Africa especially. Building connected, empowered, and resilient communities will help to reduce health disparities, and communities will have an important part to play in all this. As uh, Dr. Kim said, uh, the bottom half rather than up downward is the critical uh, thing to consider as we move forward in addressing issues of disparity as well. Uh, local partnerships uh, should be community-centered and should, follow, should adapt community-centered approach uh, for us to be able to address the things that matter most to the health and well-being of the different communities that we serve. These approaches will help us to improve access to and effectiveness of services, increase community control and connectedness, take collective action on important issues and build on community assets. It is therefore very important that communities be at the heart of every health plan in Africa and in other parts of the world. It will require us to have radical systemic change to develop power, to devolve power 
to the communities and create places that are truly community centered, whether it's a health facility or it is a, a, a housing program or it is a job uh, employment opportunities, we have to consider communities first. Uh, social and economic recoveries should be through inclusive and sustainable local enterprises so that we can see the whole system approach will help bring communities, statutory organizations, businesses, and governments together to fight inequality. Thank you very much, Masi. Uh, this has been a wonderful opportunity to meet and link up. Over to you. Thank you so much, um, Maurice, for those really wonderful insights. And I like how you've talked about the whole, uh, whole system approach. And you've talked about even how economy and businesses and everything a community does really narrows down to health equity at the end of the day. And I look forward to further partnership and engagement on the topic. Thank you. Um, over to you, Kim. I think that when we consider health equity and we've talked about all the different things that we can do from a community perspective, from a country level sort of policies and ways in which we can embed policies that really support the infrastructure of health equity, um, it all boils down to the individual at the end of the day and what we individually are willing to do to ensure that we bring health equity to the regions and the people that we serve. So I encourage all of you to consider the implicit biases, the different ways that um, you interact with those around you to consider the culture, the community, all of the different things that we've mentioned over the past couple of hours together and to really understand we have so much more that we can do together, that together yeah. we can each achieve more. Um, it's very hard to do health equity work alone. It's impossible. And so I, I am so thankful and grateful for Afro PHC for bringing us together to have these conversations. And I applaud you in your work that you are doing, each and every one of you, hard, hard work in situations that seem very difficult um, for, for all. And uh, really look forward to continuing the conversation. I do ask that you join Wonker Special Interest Group in Health Equity. Um, I am thrilled that Dr. Viviana will be able to join and visit with you next week. I hope that I too one day will be able to be back in Africa um, and, and uh, have left my heart in, in Africa, um, have been and uh, love it so very much, was in Zambia um, and worked with the clinical officers and doctors and nurses there. Um, so look forward uh, to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. I love that. Together we can achieve more. And I think um, that is what it's all about, always coming together like this every single month. And what you guys are doing even at Wonka and at your workplaces, it's quite commendable. And truly welcome to Africa. We are looking forward to having you back <laughs> and have you reconnect with your heart. So thank you um, so much for those wonderful words of insight and the presentation. And truly, we're looking forward even as Afro PHC to see how we can even work with the SIG on health equity in Wonka um, next year and see even if we can have like a series on health equity, because I think it's a topic that really needs to be amplified. Um, Viviana? Thank you so much. Um, I am just very excited that I will be in uh, Johannesburg next uh, week for I am part of the Afro PHC advisory board. And so I'm very, very excited to be able to join you all. Um, in regards to health equity, I, I, I started talking about health equity as a personal value. And, and I want I, I think it's very clear that the principle of health equity attracted many of us to health fields. At the heart of our work is the desire to help, to be of help of, to others, to care for people of all ages and in all, all life circumstances, to be accountable to our communities. And for many of us, our professions became our vehicle for social justice and health equity. 
to move the needle in health equity, to, to really make, be able to make a difference, uh, we need to learn to look for the root causes of illnesses and to help us advance whole communities towards equity in health, um, finding passion in improving health for all and making a difference, being active um, participants in true wellness in a community, can become a vehicle for personal resilience in prevention of burnout for members of the healthcare team. And so finding others that are doing health equity work, I have found has been one of my biggest and most important resources, both for resilience and for meeting the most amazing people all around the world, just like, like meeting you all today. Um, I think that, that in working to make our communities healthy, we can find that we are often restoring meaning and health to our own lives. And also remember that every time we talk about health equity, there's always data that will support our claims. So thank you very much. And again, looking forward to seeing many of you um, in Johannesburg um, this coming week. Thank you so much, Viviana. And thank you, Viviana and Kim. Viviana and Kim woke up at 3. They were up, I think, by 3 a.m. just to be with us here today. So let's give them a round of applause. We really appreciate the support and the insights that you've given us today. And welcome. We are looking forward to seeing you in Johannesburg as we discuss the Afro-PHC um, policy framework. In case you have not engaged with it, please go to our website and look at it. This is a framework for Africa, by Africa, because a lot of the insights actually have come from all the people who've been participating in our workshops since we started last year. So these are the views of the frontline healthcare workers. So please go to our website, look at the document. We will be meeting in Johannesburg next week to discuss more on the document, flesh it out, and make sure it has insights like health equity mentioned there because a lot of our policies don't really mention that and we would like even this policy to capture that. So please have a look at it. And this was our last workshop this year um, because Afro PHC is in a period of transition and planning for 2023. So I look forward to seeing you all in our workshops um, next year as well. So thank you for your support. Go to afrophc.org and just see, um, there we have so many other activities. Um, I think it was Abu was asking about CPD certificates. We do have CPDs every single Thursday where you can earn a certificate after participating. So please look at that on our website and um, earn that certificate for yourself. Um, and with that, I would like to um, bring the workshop to a close. And uh, wish Viviana and Kim a wonderful day because I know you're just starting your day. And wish you, Maurice, a wonderful rest of the day. Looking forward to continuing partnerships and collaboration. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone.